Thank you. Uh, given that Jeff has left you all on a high note, I'll, I'll bring, bring the energy down a little bit here. Um, over the past, uh, oops, pardon me. Um, over the past eight to 10 years, two facts have become increasingly clear about the first branch of our government, uh, the Congress. Uh, the first fact is that uh, this institution is more polarized than at any point uh, since the Civil War. Uh, the second fact is that the institution, even though it's meant to be the people's branch, our branch, uh, is uh, held widely in ill repute by uh, 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 citizens. Uh, and the Gallup surveys that track this routinely show that uh, not even one in five Americans has confidence in the institution. So what I want to do today to set up the talk by Senator Coons is uh, tell a story with some data that will connect the dots between these two facts and also kind of point to how this is contributing to the constitutional crisis that I think we increasingly find ourselves in. So the first thing I want to do is just look at how this polarization has evolved over, say, the past five decades. Now, there's a lot going on here. This is a map of party divisions in Congress going back to the early 1970s. And let me orient you to what you're seeing here. Each cluster of red and blue dots is all the members of the uh, House of Representatives in a given Congress. Um, and the, we start off in the top row, that is basically Congress in the 70s, we work from left to right, the second row is in the 80s, the third row is late 80s or mid 90s, the fourth row is the late 90s, and then the fifth row culminates in the Tea Party Congress uh, that was elected in, in 2010. Um, now, each dot represents an individual legislator. The blue dots are for Democrats, the red dots are for Republicans, and this really innovative group of social scientists has arrayed these dots so they show the members most proximate to those they are most collaborating with inside the institution. Now, this is of the House, but the same picture could be drawn of the Senate. Now, there's a couple of patterns that I want to draw your attention to. If you look up in the upper left, so that's the, the Congress in the early 1970s, um, you actually see it's kind of a cloud in which the reds and blues are intermingled. And uh, some of us of a certain age, you might remember that at that point in time, in the early 70s, if I told you a member of Congress was a liberal or a conservative, or if I told you they were supportive of protecting the environment or opposed to abortion rights, any one of those pieces of information wouldn't have given you a whole bunch to go on in terms of trying to place them in a particular party because at that time, both parties were broad and overlapping coalitions, um, and they were really intermingled on those ideologies and issues. But if you come down here to the lower right in the Tea Party Congress, over that 50-year period, the two parties had really um, uh, sorted themselves out so that all the liberals were in the Democratic Party, all the conservatives were in the Republican Party, and on issues like the environment, abortion, gun rights, they had very clearly sorted, and so that obviously raises the stakes um, uh, for legislative of action, uh, makes it harder to work across the aisle, um, and, and you start to see the, the, real, the real sorting that occurs. There's a second pattern that's a little subtler, but we can pick it out here. Um, if you look at the first couple of rows, there's a whole bunch more blue dots than red dots, and that reflects the fact that really for a 40-year period up to the mid-90s, uh, Congress was basically a democratic institution. The Democrats uh, had majorities in Congress for 40 years and virtually all of that same time in the Senate with one exception. But something started to change here, if, you can, if I can uh, get this. Over in the middle, the, the last one in the middle row, that is the uh, 104th Congress that was elected in 1994. That is the Gingrich Revolution, um, where for the first time uh, in 40 years, the Republicans won a majority. Uh, in the House, they also took the Senate. And what you start to see is after that Congress in these bottom two rows, the, the blues and red dots are, are roughly equally sized. And you also see more alterations. So this is uh, 2006 when Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats retook the House. And then of course the Republicans retook it in 2010. And the Democrats have taken it back just more recently. So as, you, as the majorities get narrower and fluctuate, it really changes the dynamics and the incentives for collaboration in Congress. It basically uh, eradicates them because 
uh, narrow majorities and fluctuating majorities are in what, what Francis Lee, a leading political scientist, has termed are insecure majorities, um, in which the majority wants to do everything they can to marginalize the minority, and the minority, in turn, wants to do everything they can to unhorse the majority by embarrassing them, making them look bad. So it's, it's, we have an ideological sorting here, but a lot of the polarization is just old-fashioned political combat for control of these institutions. So that's the, the dynamic that's unfolded in recent decades. Let's turn and look at a couple of the consequences of these. One is, uh, as we look externally, one consequence has been that this polarization in Congress has really trickled down and out to the electorate. You know, there's, there's a democratic theory that says, you know, the people hold views and then the representatives reflect those views. One of the things that political scientists are increasingly convinced of is actually the effect goes in the other direction. The leaders share perspectives, send cues to people, voters and citizens who kind of echo, echo those. And so this is data that the Pew Research Center here in town assembles, um, tracking the, the orientation of Republicans and Democrats in the electorate. And you see here, we saw the polarization really in Congress really take shape in 1994. Really, for about 10 years, there still was a lot of overlap between Republican and Democratic perspectives in the electorate. But in, in the past dozen or so years, you really start to see that same kind of polarization, the negative polarization in particular uh, that Jonah was talking about, where if you're in one party, you often see the members of the other party not simply as wrong or misguided, but as enemies or threats to the Republic. Some of you may have even encountered them at your Thanksgiving dinner a couple weeks ago. Um, so this is what's happening outside of Congress. Uh, inside of Congress, uh, there's also some negative consequences. One is, as Congress has become more partisan, it just has done less of the work that we expect it to do when it comes to legislating and overseeing the executive. Now what this chart represents is the number of committee and subcommittee meetings over time. Uh, from the late 70s uh, up through the, the last Congress. And what you see is that number basically dropping from just shy of 11,000 in a given Congress, and the blue is the House, the red is the Senate meetings, uh, to under 4,000. So more than a 50% decrease. This is a big problem because Congress and committees is where Congress gets its work done. This is where you have people who can specialize, who can focus, who can learn the policy areas, um, it's where you have bipartisanship because the, the committees are, have people from both sides working to hash out stuff. You have the deliberation, the negotiation, the compromise, where you do things like mark up legislation and oversee executive branch officials. So if there's just far fewer of these meetings occurring, there's much less of the basic stuff of the work we expect Congress to do uh, getting done. So not surprisingly, if Congress isn't doing the work that we expect it to do, it's also not fulfilling the broader constitutional purposes that Madison and company intended for it to do, which is really to allow popular majorities to work their will, as Michelle was just, just mentioning here. So the next chart reflects some data assembled by Sarah Binder of the Brookings Institution, who's a member of the, of the commission. And what she does is say, okay, what are the, the most salient issues that the public is concerned about in any given Congress? And to what extent is Congress in a position to deal with them in some way without passing judgment on how effectively the way is? Or to what extent are those issues effectively gridlocked? Congress can't take any action because there's such disagreement. And what you see here over the post-war era, but especially in, in recent years, is an increasingly number of these salient issues being gridlocked. And so we can think in recent years you know, you can list on, on uh, you know, both hands and you probably need to take off your shoes to count all the issues that are, are serious issues that are gridlocked, like climate, like immigration, like the budget deficit, um, like the war now in Afghanistan that's going into its uh, 18th year. So, um, so this is a big problem because it's really in Congress that these issues are meant to be hashed out and where we're meant to kind of have solutions prepared for the nation. Now, the fact that they're not being tackled in Congress presents uh, another problem because there are shortcuts. There are other ways to tackle this. The presidency, uh, who in our system has a lot of capacity for unilateral action, can figure out, well, what can I do to solve this? And presidents of both parties, um, Republicans and Democrats, have gone about doing this. Here's, here's uh, President Obama. Um, who got to the point, he got so frustrated, you might recall the Republican Congress, 
where he said, I'm not going to wait any longer. I've got a phone and a pen, and here we see him with his phone and pen signing an executive order. And on issue after issue that was in gridlock, whether it was climate, whether it was immigration, uh, looking at the uh, nuclear negotiations um, with Iran, he took unilateral executive action. And you know, I, I, I'm, I'm based out in Silicon Valley, and my uh, liberal uh, friends and colleagues there love this. These were policy wins. Keep them coming. Uh, my friends and family where I grew up in rural Michigan didn't like it so much. They said, well, who gives that guy the right to make laws for our country? Um, so that's one of the problems is that in a polarized society, when the presidency, one person starts making laws, it actually exacerbates the polarization because half the people love it and then half the people hate it. Um, but there's another problem with the idea of having the legislative or the presidency make law unilaterally, which is subsequent presidents also have phones and pens. And if you think about these complex policy issues on climate, on immigration, on these negotiations, this uh, multi-state treaty or a multi-state agreement with um, Iran on the nuclear uh, negotiations. You know, basically, President Trump has made a point and actually delighted in reverting, negating, confounding each of these. So, you know, what can be done with one president's phone and pen can be undone, uh, you know, often without regard to consequence by the next president. So this is not the way for us to govern a diverse uh, country of 300 uh, plus million people. We need to find a way to get Congress back in the business of representing the full spectrum of, the, of opinion in the country, uh, reconciling it, balancing it, and giving us a modicum of policy solutions. So you might say, okay, well, okay, great, but how do we start to do that? There are, I think, three potential ways we could get Congress back in the business that it's meant to be in. And I have question marks besides each three because it's not obvious to me that these will necessarily come to pass, and if they come to pass, they will necessarily solve the problem. But I think these are all possibilities, and I think there's potential in each of them. And the first one is a political realignment. Uh, that would reshuffle uh, the party divide, that might bring back in more secure majorities that could work productively in Congress. We periodically have those in American history. We had one in the 1890s, in the 1930s. Uh, we had a sort of one in the 1980s. And we might look back uh, five or 10 years from now and see uh, the past couple of elections as the early harbingers of, of this kind of realignment. So that's a possibility in ways that could solve some of these problems and lead to more policy resolution in Congress. Uh, the second one is our, our electoral reforms um, uh, in Congress, you know, in how members of Congress are elected, whether it's the, the districting reform that uh, you all had experienced here in Pennsylvania, the ranked choice voting that uh, voters in Maine have used, the uh, campaign finance reforms that some states and localities have been adopting. These are all uh, possibilities that will also make a difference and reduce the sway that the parties and partisanship hold uh, on individual members. Another uh, possibility here, and this is one where there's actually a lot of pent-up energy, and I think you're seeing this come to pass in the, as this new Congress gets organized, is that there's a whole bunch of members of Congress who are just immiserated by this current system and would like to find ways to get back in the business. They don't like uh, the, the, the kind of the sorry lot that they've been handed. Um, and there's a number of proposals, including one in the rules package that uh, Nan, uh, Speaker Pelosi or potential Speaker Pelosi is developing uh, in the House uh, that really could strengthen the institution of Congress and enable it to once again do the kind of work in committees uh, that we would expect and want it to do. And if you look back in history, Congress kind of rebooted itself uh, in the 1940s and the 1970s, and I wouldn't be surprised over the next five to 10 years if it was able to do so um, once again. However, so again, each of these things could help, but at the end of the day, uh, what we need are, are leaders and citizens that you know, kind of recognize this is the institution that we need to have work for our democracy to function. So, you know, you know, we can think about all the different reforms and mechanisms, but it's, it's leaders and, uh, and who are willing to kind of raise their hand and run for office, as in a really exciting way, a lot of new fresh voices were in this last election, and it's voters who are seeking them out, who are asking people to run, who are supporting them, who are canvassing, 
that make the difference. And this is actually a really, it's a, it's a Madisonian point. At the Virginia Ratifying Convention, i just read this quote here. This is uh, Madison responding to critics at the Virginia Ratifying Convention who were just very skeptical that this scheme of government uh, he was proposing would work. And he said, at the end of the day, we need to have some faith in, 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 in our leaders and the ability of people to discern who is going to provide better representation. Now, I've adjusted the, uh, the gendered comment there a bit, but the rest of it, I think, stands, stands up pretty well. And you might be thinking, okay, that's, a, that's a, an illusion, or maybe that will occur. I think what you're about to see uh, with our next speaker, Senator Coons, is a, is a living example of this is the kind of people, person we need in Congress. Um, so without passing judgment on any of our other legislators or representatives, at least you have one exemplar here where this senator and his state have this figured out, then I suspect the rest of us can contribute to the solution also. So anyway, thanks very much.